Today, an unsettling incident in the nation's capital sparks concerns for the safety of President Biden's granddaughter. Speaker of the House Johnson is days away from another government shutdown, and another GOP candidate for president drops out of the race. We have all that and more, and it starts right now. Well, hey there. Happy Monday. Welcome to the news and why it matters. I'm Hillary Kennedy. I'm filling in for Sarah Gonzalez. I haven't been here in a while, but I have to say I'm excited to be back because I'm at the table with all the cool kids, starting with Pat Gray, who you may know from such fantastic programs as Pat Gray Unleashed. Glad to have you here today. Thank you. Good to be here. Mr. Rob Eno, Blaze Media Critic. I'm an all-around funny guy. Thanks for having me. <laughs> you had nothing funny to add there. That's no, all right. They'll see. Fine. They'll see as the show goes on. And then Matthew Peterson, our editor in chief of Blaze Media, which, by the way, the new Blaze Media website looks incredible. It is amazing. It is. If I do say so myself. Yes. It I is, didn't make it. <laughs> it's worth the price Better of admission. Did, yes. Yeah, the stories, the editorials, the reporting, it's all really incredible. And we're going to actually feature a lot of those stories on the show today, which I'm excited about. So. We will dive right in. We're going to start first with a story about Secret Service agents. They were protecting Naomi Biden, which is President Joe Biden's granddaughter. They opened fire after three people tried to break into an SUV. Now, she wasn't actually in that SUV, but she was in the Georgetown neighborhood on Sunday night. So these three individuals, they tried to gain access to the vehicle. It prompted one of the agents to open fire, according to the Associated Press. Now, they said nobody was struck during the gunfire. The three individuals, they were seen driving away from the scene in a red vehicle. So they, the Metropolitan Police, they said to be on the lookout for a vehicle. But this is really becoming a problem, not just in D.C., but nationwide, but especially in D.C. Boy, the numbers of carjackings have really gone up. I mean, just the, the crime stats in general. Nearly 26,000 criminal incidents in 2023 alone. 20% of the crimes reported are considered acts of violence, which include sexual assaults, robberies, homicides. This is pretty incredible. Uh, the most significant rise in crime, though, has been due to the prevalence of car theft. Twice as many vehicles stolen in 2023. So this is happening quite a bit. Why do you think this? I mean, it's happening everywhere, and it's mainly with youth. They're seeing it with a lot of under underage, under the age of 18, teenagers. Why do you think this is happening, Pat? Uh, Democrat-controlled cities, yeah. I think. Um, as, you, as you look around the country and you see all these Democrat-controlled cities, it's happening in all of them. It's not just Washington, D.C. It's, it's all over the nation. And uh, I think it's going to continue to happen until people realize that they're not tough on crime. They don't care about things like uh, carjacking. They they. Uh, don't care if unless it's over a thousand dollars in a lot of places uh, it's not even a felony until you've stolen a thousand dollars worth of merchandise i mean i think you're sending a really bad signal to people um who would commit these kinds of crimes well and i, I want to get your take on this too i wanted to, you brought up a great point about if things aren't over a thousand dollars this is happening so often at like walgreens and cvs and so the crime is so bad in the nation's capital. CVS took pictures of their products mm. and have them on their shelves. And then customers have to like ask or ring a bell to have them come right. over and physically bring the product. What are your thoughts, Rob? I know you have a lot to say on this. Yeah, no, it, it, it's just crazy that the car stuff um, is is predominantly Democratic cities. But even here in, in red state Texas, I mean, I used to live around a neighborhood that was a, a somewhat nice neighborhood down the street from here um, where our studios are in Irving, Texas. And the car thefts are just ridiculous around mm -hmm. that neighborhood. And if you look at the, um, the crime maps, I kind of looked at the crime maps when I moved to a new place and, and looked at a place that didn't have the car thefts. But people were getting broken into. My, my parking garage at my apartment complex, somebody jacked up an SUV, a, a Suburban, I think, and took the tires off and left it jacked up in the middle of the night. So this stuff is just happening, mm -hmm. and it's catalytic converters. Um, a lot of it has to do with the, the actual raw materials that go into a car being so expensive because of mm -hmm. inflation that a lot of that stuff is getting so, stolen too. But I, I, and cops just aren't, they don't have time to go after all the crimes, which is why I think you're seeing um, what you're seeing in D.C. And I think California too has the whole, you have to go in the back to get things, um, stuff. It's just, it's insane lately. It's crazy. 
Yeah, I mean, I was just in California, I don't know, last weekend, I think, and inexplicably, tinfoil was behind the counter. I'm not sure whether that was... <laughs> tinfoil was, was hidden in the back uh, at a CVS. Um, I don't know whether that's just where I was or what, but that sort of thing is happening, as well as, uh, what, highways spontaneously combusting, <laughs> melting yeah. and burning the tin. I mean, yeah. th- because of a homeless encamp- encampment, most likely. So, I mean, this is, this is a, a trend, but I, I look at it, I mean, it's just, it's just a calculation. It's almost an equation. If you don't prosecute crime, as Pat said, if you just say, well, there's no, you know, n- nothing underneath X number of dollars, you're fine. Uh, which is happening in Texas, in Dallas, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Underneath $750, we won't bother. Then crime will go up. I mean, it, it's, th- this isn't rocket science. I mean, th- there's all these political scientists and social scientists who spent you know, years saying, well, well, it's really complicated. And you see, we need to change our policies. And at the end of the day, you know, if you're not punished, you're going to commit crime. So you right. either have law and order or you don't. We've decided not to, and here we are. I think about the the Disney movie Aladdin where he his monkey steals an apple or whatever and he's going to get his hand chopped off for stealing an apple. <laughs> and now if you steal anything less than $1000, they're like, "Nah, free pass." By the way, you know what's crazy? Just real quick, Secret Service is shooting at people. I was thinking I, the same thing. Were they armed? Yeah. Were they shooting well, at unarmed people? They, they were just breaking into the Now she wasn't there, too. Right. That's yeah. uh, mm-hmm. that's an important element of that. So I don't know why you're shooting at these people when they're just breaking into a car. Feels like Brazil. Yeah. It's bizarre. I mean, where's the body cam footage on that? Are they going to release that? Interesting question. And, and will this make Joe Biden think twice about pushing some of these policies where they don't care if you steal something or you carjack someone when it involves his own granddaughter? I mean, I wonder if that hits a little closer to home or if he's even able to comprehend what's going on. I, mean, I, I think the, the speaker to bring the, you know, D.C. into this and what's going on in D.C., the, the Republicans in the House are really trying to tie a lot of the funding for D.C. into taking back over some of the, because they, they fund and D.C. is actually, there is a mayor, but it's really under the purview of the federal government. The federal government can make laws. They're looking to tie some of the federal funding to them actually doing their job and stopping crime. Hmm. Well, what I, I thought was interesting, if you live in Washington, D.C. and you're worried about being carjacked or someone stealing your car and you're not knowing where it is, don't worry. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser She launched a program with the police that provides drivers free digital tracking tags for their vehicles in the event they're stolen. So, I mean, hey, problem solved, right? And if you're curious, I just wanted to know, like, what are people stealing? Because I wanted to, is it one of the cars that I drive? So if you have a Chevy full-size pickup, a Ford full-size pickup, a Honda Civic, Honda Accord, Toyota Camry, GMC full-size pickup, Nissan Altima, Honda CRV, a Jeep Grand Cherokee, or a Toyota Corolla, watch your back because those are, mm. those are the popular ones to steal, apparently. All right, so let's talk about New York Mayor Eric Adams. We've seen a lot of Democrats suddenly finally being investigated and called out for some things. But uh, federal authorities are investigating whether he, weeks before his election two years ago, pressured the New York Fire Department officials to sign off on the Turkish government's new high-rise consulate in Manhattan. Despite there being safety concerns with the building, uh, this was according to three people with knowledge on the matter. So they're saying after he won his primary, Mr. Adams contacted then Fire Commissioner Daniel Nigro in late summer 2021 and urged him to allow the Turkish government to occupy the building, at least on a temporary basis. But the building had yet to be open because fire officials said, hey, you know, it hasn't met safety standards. What are your thoughts on this? And there finally being an investigation into Eric Adams' background. This one's kind of fun because it's Democrat on Democrat. And um, I love it when liberals eat their own. This is really fun. Um, I think he's being made an example of because he's he's whining about illegal immigration and they are making a public display of him right now, investigating one of his main aides, uh, going into her house and taking her computer and her iPad and her phones. And then they stop him at an event in public and take his phones and his iPad from him in front of everybody. And wouldn't you normally do that with a mayor of the biggest city in the country in private? I, I think I think they're sending a message that, um, all right, if, if you're not going to stay in line, you're going to be embarrassed. Yeah, and I think we have a clip with uh, Eric Adams calling out the Biden administration. Let's play that. Let them come fix it. Our insurance was the federal government, and they're saying to our insurance contract, we're not giving you anything. So now we have to, you, me, taxpayers, have to find 
$12 billion out of a $30 billion budget. It has to come from somewhere. It has to come from somewhere. And they're leaving us stranded. Stranded. And the worst part about it, we could easily get another two to 300,000 more migrant asylum seekers in the next few months. We're getting, we're getting anywhere from 2,500 to 4,000 a week. A week. And the next, they say, well, Eric, why don't you just stop letting them in? It's against the law. Federal law does not allow me to do that. Well, why don't you just deport? It's against the law. Federal law doesn't allow me to do that. This has created a crisis that's wrong for New York taxpayers, wrong for the migrants, and wrong for our city, and wrong for our country. All right, so he is speaking out. And Rob, I know you have some hot, hot takes on uh, Representative Quaylar because he also spoke out about the immigration plan, correct? Yeah, this is, this is Pat's exactly right. This is what's happening to Donald Trump. It's what the, the FBI has become politicized and is being used as a way to go after the enemies of the Biden administration. You saw it with Representative Quaylar here in Texas. Um, he started going um, after the, the lack of border protection because he's in a border district um, here in Texas. And uh, magically, he was investigated for things. And then later it came out, well, he really wasn't the, the topic of the investigation. And I don't think anything's gone with the investigation. But they made a public spectacle of it, like, like you said. And that's exactly what's going on here. If you get too tall, for your, you know, too big for your britches, if you, you jump up over... Uh, the heads and make yourself um, an example, the Biden administration and this weaponized Justice Department's going to go after you, especially if you're a Democrat, to, to scare the other Democrats from going off the reservation. And that's exactly what's happening here. It's not the first time it's happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, what's going on in big city politics generally when you see these corruption cases rise, the first question should always be, uh, well, who are who's fighting whom, right? Because these cities generally, this kind of stuff, like you leaned on the, you know, the plea, the the fire chief, whatever. I mean, to put up a building like this, this this is not even this doesn't rise to the level of national news. They're not even mm -hmm. accusing him of wrongdoing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's called governing. So when you yeah. when you see that, <laughs> and even even if they were, by the way, it, 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 there there is normalized corruption going on in big cities in America every day. That's how they're yeah. run now. Uh, and I can't speak to the details in New York, but I certainly used to be able to for L.A. And people would be shocked if they knew uh, how these cities were run. So when you see this, you know someone else is fighting uh, this person, right? They're, they're being attacked by other forces. That's the only reason that they're in trouble. Uh, in this case, it almost is so blindingly, glaringly uh, in your face, right? Yeah. It almost seems too obvious. Mm -hmm. Could they really just be doing this just because the guy is speaking out and sounds sounds like I? W I mean, I wish every Republican sounded like Eric Adams on immigration. I mean, he, he's been great. Yeah. Um, so, are they really doing that? And I, I think in this day and age, the answer is probably yeah, they are. Yeah, that's where we're at now. I agree with you. I'm, I'm glad that Adams has the stance that he has on immigration for sure. We hope we hear more mm -hmm. of it. Boy, they're putting the squeeze on him now. All right, so we are about to go to break. Um, we're going to be talking about Mike Johnson when we come back. But first, you know what? For years, Hollywood has been lacking when it comes to stories of redemption. The movies and TV shows, they've trended toward the anti-hero, the flawed person who makes no effort to change and just becomes worse and worse as the story goes on. Well, here's some great news. The Blind, the true story of the Robertson family, it's now available for purchase on Blaze TV. So maybe you've made a mess of your life. Maybe somebody that you love is in a dark place. Maybe all of the above. But if you or someone you know feels beyond redemption, you need to watch this movie. You'll see that there is always hope, always. And The Blind, it takes you on an incredible journey through the life of Phil Robertson and gives you an intimate look into the man behind the legend and the trials, the triumphs, and the values that have shaped him throughout the years. So while The Blind, it wasn't a Blaze Media production, but since Phil is such a big part of our Blaze TV family, we wanted to make sure that you had the opportunity to stream it here. And because it isn't ours, we can't include it as part of the subscription, but if you'd rather purchase it and stream it here rather than Apple or Amazon, we wanted to make sure that the opportunity was there. So act now. 
Don't miss this opportunity to own The Blind, a Phil Robertson story on Blaze TV. You can buy it today at blazetv.com slash the blind for $19.99. That's blazetv.com slash the blind. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. So let's talk about Mike Johnson. And boy, the media assault on him, it was, it was immediate. So since he's become Speaker of the House, against all odds, um, boy, he's really been facing just a firing squad about a myriad of things. Rolling Stone put out a headline basically saying, you know, he's an ultra MAGA extremist, uh, which they pretty much call every Republican at this point. But we, there's an opinion piece from Blaze Media that is incredibly insightful about this. And we also have an, a, a clip of an MSNBC liberal talking about Speaker Johnson being worse than Trump. So we'll get into both of those things. Let's play the clip first. Mike Johnson, more people are going to know about Mike Johnson by November of 2024. 24, many people are going to know about Mike Johnson as know about Donald Trump. It's absolutely amazing to me that with trying to remove Donald Trump, they, they heightened Mike Johnson, who on many ways is way worse than Donald Trump. <laughs> OK, so in this Blaze media piece uh, by Nicholas Waddy, he talks about, you know, it's a pretty low threshold for, for terror. Mm -hmm. So, Matthew, what are your thoughts on this? Because, you know, a lot of Americans are just kind of getting to know Mike Johnson and what he's about. But, boy, the liberals are really right out of the gate just trying to paint him as if he's another Hitler. Yeah, I mean, he said, go pick up, pick a Bible off your shelf and read it. Uh, and this is, these are the most terrifying words in the 21st century. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty wild. They're not going to stop, uh, number one. But as uh, Wadi says in this opinion piece at Blaze, the question is, what is he going to be able to accomplish? Because as crazy as it sounds, the author says here, the hardest part is yet to come. I mean, it was a miracle that he got in there. But remember, this is a job that it was unclear whether how many people really wanted, how many competent people wanted this job because the Republicans are so fractured. And um, that's the problem. I mean, you do have a uniparty. It's very hard to corral the Republicans. As we see, they, they vote for the FBI to get big new offices to persecute them. Uh, so, you know, his job now really begins, and we can assume the media will call him Hitler, uh, but what is he going to do within the building? That's, that's, where the, that's where it counts, and we'll see. Right. What do you think, Rob? Because, I mean, when you're in the position that Mike Johnson is in, and you've got Big Pharma, one of the, the biggest lobbyists, if not the biggest... In, in the world, really, I mean, and he's, he's having to really go up against working with people who are all about the money and big pharma. And a lot of times people do cave. I mean, it's just easier to go along with the way things have always been done. Right. In, in one, of the piece, one of the things that's highlighted um, in, in Wadi's piece is the fact that um, the, the, the big secret, and it's not really a secret if you know, it, it, Congress critters don't write legislation. It's written by lobbyists. And the thing that he highlights is that there's, um, I don't know exactly what it's called, I forget what he, what he called it, but there's a certain position in the healthcare industry that's basically the, the negotiator position that keeps, you know, drug prices low um, for, for government plans, for HMOs, for things like that. And they're looking to defund those positions in the effort to save money for the government that's going to end up costing you and I a thousand dollars a year extra in in medical costs, right? Mm -hmm. So th those are the types of things that they do. DC is a transactional environment, and that's why the left loved Kevin McCarthy, right? Is Kevin McCarthy was a transactional political creature. That is the world he grew up in. Kevin McCarthy used to make deals with the, the Speaker of the California Assembly to put the Republicans that Kevin didn't like in the basement if he didn't like it, so it wasn't him doing it. Like th those are documented things that Kevin's always done. And it's why I've always had a problem uh, with Kevin McCarthy going, going way back. And it's kind of funny that you get what you, what you wish for, I guess. I think the Democrats thought it would be hilarious to, to throw the entire country into chaos when Matt Gaetz um, put up his resolution for the, uh, for the vote of no confidence in the speaker. And lo and behold, we might actually have a conservative speaker. But I think that that's why the left is so up in arms in, in doing what they're doing. It's, it's not that he's worse than Donald Trump. That's the hyperbole that they're going to use. Not, not that being worse than Donald Trump would be a bad thing, I guess, um, from our point of view, but he's actually going to do the things maybe that Republicans get elected for and hold them accountable. 
Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see what happens, but I think that that's what they're more upset with is they don't have a transactional person they can control. Well, and Johnson, he put up a tweet about the congressional budget. He said, in my first two weeks as Speaker of the House, passed three standalone appropriations bills. I'm committed to returning Washington to regular order, but you can't fix a decades-old broken system in a matter of weeks. We'll bring to the floor next week to keep the government open. So, I don't know, Pat, do you think he's going to stick to his guns? He's going to bring a fresh new take to things, or do you think he's going to be I've, more I've of the same? I've lost a lot of confidence in the Republican Party. Um, I seriously doubt it. But I hope, you know, I have some hope that he will. Yeah. Um, but here we are, three days away now from another government shutdown, which is fine with me. It's just, it's just that the Democrats do such a good job of marketing their hysteria that they make it sound like if the government shuts down, it's the worst thing that could possibly happen when most of us realize that all the necessary things continue to happen under a government shutdown. Social Security, Medicare payments, all of those things still continue to happen. So really, be a great thing if they're, they're not able to spend more of our money uh, right. for a few days. But we're right back in the same position we were two months ago. And even if they pass this continuing resolution, we're going to be back in it again 75 days from now. Well, and you, you brought up a great point. We had a, another op-ed on Blaze Media by columnist Chris Bray asking, why bother with the GOP if this is mm. all it has to offer? Because they're saying we've become accustomed to a Republican Party that sides with its dumbest, laziest enemies. Maybe we should consider mm. not doing that anymore. So, I mean, to your point, awesome. then let it shut down, yeah. you know. Yeah. And he talks about the beginning of the Republican Party. Uh, and maybe it's time to begin another party. That's really a tough proposition right now. Um, because we, we don't have a sacrificial lamb right now to run like John C. Freeman back in 1856. And there's no Abraham Lincoln in, on the bench right now for the next election. So without, without an Abraham Lincoln, somebody that we can all rally behind, I don't know how you even start a third party, but it's a, it's a great thought. Yeah, brave. Because Republicans have let us down. Yeah, definitely. And he, he said, we keep chasing out the elected officials who make it too obvious, but every effort to replace an Adam Kinzinger or Liz Cheney just leads to the emergence of a new zombie who steps forward to take their places. So true. That is very true. Well, it, I mean, he also talks a lot about how, you know, the FBI and the Justice Department, they keep making these January 6th cases and Republicans keep going along with it. We need some people to stand up and just say no more and start mm -hmm. something fresh and new. But uh, yes, we've all become accustomed to a Republican Party that sides with this dumbest, laziest enemies. I, we should consider not doing that anymore. Very well written. All right, one quick thing that I want to uh, play for you at the end, a clip of Senator Tim Scott ending his presidential run. Let's take a look. One of the things I would recommend to every single American, I know it's not possible, by the way, if you ever want to love your country more, run for president. Traveling this country, meeting people has been one of the most fantastic experiences of my entire life. I love America more today than I did on May 22nd. But when I go back to Iowa, it will not be as a presidential uh, candidate. I am suspending my campaign. I, I think the voters... Uh, who are the most remarkable people on the planet have been really clear that they're telling me uh, not now, Tim. I don't think they're saying, Trey, no, but I do think they're saying not now. And so I'm going to respect the voters and I'm going to hold on and keep working really hard and uh, look forward to another opportunity. Are there any surprises here <laughs> from Tim Scott ending his presidential run? I think the surprise is that it's happening this early in the cycle. This time in 2016, it didn't happen early in the cycle. You had 32 candidates, I think it was. We had the the, the regular debate, and I think what we called the kids table debates, where like they would have two debates in one night and mm -hmm. and those sorts of things. I think that the Republican Party did a very good job, not that they always do, but in limiting who could actually participate in the debates to the people that are showing that they're actually viable candidates. Mm -hmm. And I think this has a lot more to do with propping up Nikki Haley than it does with Tim Scott getting out. His donors are her donors are going or his donors are going, going to her. Naked. That's yeah. exactly yeah. right. It's a sign. It's just a sign to me that Haley is consolidating. And after all, why bother? I mean, right. We're, single digits. Yeah. Pence down, Scott down. All right. The playing field's getting smaller. We're going to go to break. We come back. We're going to be talking about the teachers unions. Everyone's favorite. So stick around. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, things are a changing at the New Jersey Teachers Union because they are seeking to eliminate the basic skills test requirement for aspiring educators. They're saying it's time to eliminate another barrier. So New Jersey does require that candidates for teacher certification pass a basic skills test. Um, it's reading, writing, math, or they have to show SAT, ACT, or GRE scores in the top third percentile for the year that they were taken. But they're wanting to do away with that in order for people to become certified teachers because they're really having a hard time getting people to, to teach at this point. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Because they're saying they've got a, a national teacher shortage and it's especially bad in New Jersey. Do you think this is a good thing, Matthew? Do you think this is a bad thing? I mean, I think that uh, having analyzed student scores and teachers, teacher, teacher, teacher programs, like programs teaching teachers in New Jersey, uh, in rural, urban, and suburban, you know, uh, communities, I can just tell you, <laughs> it'd be really nice if they kept this. <laughs> I mean, I'm not for uh, over-regulating or certifying teachers. We need people who are older and retired and know something about life to come in and talk to students. Yes. But this is clearly an effort to get rid of, you know, any kind of intellectual basic competency test. And so there is, I admit, part of me that's a little bit accelerationist on this, where I say, good, you know, get rid of all the requirements. Get rid of all the grades, just let it go. I mean, maybe we just have to let it melt down like that and then people will get, you know, some sense back. But I can tell you that they, yeah, they could use keeping this. It would probably be helpful. I mean, it just seems like so many people, so many teachers during the pandemic, after trying to deal with virtual learning and the hassles that came with all of that, so many people just said, I can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So there is this shortage. What do you think the answer is there, Rob? What do you think? Um, I, I think that less regulation is usually good and you would get more teachers. Like, like Matthew said, you know, do you get... Right now, you can't become a teacher if you don't have a teaching degree, if you don't have a master's degree. There's a whole yeah, group of things that, that stop you. Those, I think, would be the first things I would look at getting rid of. Because mm -hmm. you would think that if you had a master's degree, you would have basic competency if you had a, a, a higher education degree. But that really can't be used to tell you. So I think this is as much, a, um, as, as much of a, uh, a, a strike on our higher education system as it is anything else that they're graduating people that can't pass this test, mm -hmm. apparently. Pat, Seems to be a little bit of the dumbing down process that we're going through. You know, the students can't cut it, so you make things easier for them. You take away the tests, you change the grading curve, and now we can't get teachers, so we're gonna dumb down the requirements to, to become mm -hmm. a teacher. I, I, it's a little dangerous, I think. Just to fill those thoughts. Well, it's interesting because the, the president of the American Federation of Teachers, Randy Weingarten, she tweeted out yesterday mm -hmm. a link to an article from Axios, what's behind the increase in homeschooling? And the article from Axios goes on to detail why people are moving towards homeschooling. Lots of different reasons. They're saying that homeschooling is now the fastest growing form of education in the United States, which is honestly kind of surprising in, in a lot of ways because of just, you know, the, the economy the way it is and people, lots of people working multiple jobs. But parents are making the sacrifice and taking control of education because there are 1.9 million to 2.7 million homeschooled students in the U.S. now. So they're saying in the article a lot of it's political reasons, religious reasons, and because they, they, they learned during the pandemic that Zoom school just wasn't effective. Their kids weren't learning anything. And I think it was the first time for a lot of parents where you really saw what your kids were being taught in school and you realized, like, this is not at all what they should be learning, or this isn't what I thought it would be, or what in the world's going on in the classroom, or you find out there's things in the curriculum that are completely the opposite of what your children to be taught in school. So what are your thoughts on this homeschool? Do you think this is a trend, or do you think it's here to stay? Oh, it's definitely here to stay. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think you ever, unless you outlaw it, which they will try to, um, it's, it's just, it's on a I mean, it, it took off. I mean, it mm -hmm. you know, tripled, right, in, in that first year. So there's, there's no end to this because people, it's not just homeschooling, too. When people say homeschooling, they act as if, you know, that's just like a, they used to act as if it was a family in a log cabin or something. Right. <laughs> but you're talking about usually a large support network, other people doing it as well, being able to find tutors for your kids, and then having curriculum and access, you know, a lot of times to remote teachers for, for some of it. So 
it, it really is, uh, it, it's only going to grow. And I think it's a great thing because people are realizing how bad the system is and getting outside of it. And when they do that, they experiment and develop new models and new, new ways of, of doing things. Yeah, I know a lot of people at homeschool, and it's that if, if one parent has ex subject expertise in a certain subject, that's the parent that they all go to do, you know, to do that class. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned that the pandemic showed what they were learning in the Zoom school, and it didn't work, but I think that you're starting to see some models with that, too, that it's, it's not just you alone homeschooling, like you said, remote teachers. If they do outlaw homeschooling, I could see remote schooling becoming a, a, a thing where, you know, instead of going to a private school for $20,000 a year, you pay $1,000 to get access to people teaching a bunch of people over Zoom because that can, that can scale, right? If you're teaching one kid over the internet, you can teach 500 or 600 be, if the parent's there to back you up. And I think that that is, is a paradigm shift as people are, you know, don't want to come back into work. You're seeing downtowns completely empty across the country, the, the commercial real estate market, you know, bottoming out. I think you're starting to see some of those things mm -hmm. um, in effect, and you will with schooling. My wife and I homeschooled for 23 years. Wow. And, and when we first started, there weren't the, um, the materials and the help available that there is today. Today, it is so much easier to homeschool than it ever has been because you've got the online things, you've got co-ops. There's a lot of groups. If you just go online and Google it, you'll find uh, people in your area that you can get together with and, and you find somebody, like Rob said, who's, who has some expertise in some subject and they teach the kids that mm -hmm. day. Uh, you can do it yourself. You can do it online. There's a million different ways to approach homeschooling and a million uh, different aids that, that are available to people now. And the reasons for homeschooling, uh, I think, have gotten a lot stronger over the yes. last few decades because you see what's going on in our school system. Um, kids aren't safe either uh, indoctrination-wise or even physically in some cases. You've got the trans situation with, with men going into women's locker rooms and bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, You've the got the shootings. drugs. Yeah. Yeah, shootings. Yeah. You know, people used to say to us all the time, well, what about the social aspect? I'm like, yeah, that's exactly why we do it. We don't want. <laughs> we don't want we them don't socializing want with everybody. Yeah. Social aspect. <laughs> it's so true. Well, I, I agree with you. It's something, I have a five year old, and so that's something we've been looking into a lot. And even these classical schools, a lot of them will offer a hybrid mm -hmm. where you can go three days a week and have them home two days a week. But I love that there mm -hmm. are so many more options. Like you said, now they're making there it are. much easier which is fantastic. And I have to say, all the homeschooled people that I've met out in the workforce, usually the sharpest people in the bunch. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Oh, good. Now's the time when I mentioned I was homeschooled. Oh, all right. Well, see, yeah. there we go. Well, there we can go. tell. We can now tell I'm here. on the blaze. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> see, you too, if you're homeschooled, one day this could be you. All right, we've got to go to break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about, there are a lot of public figures recently that are announcing that they have decided to follow Christianity. So we're going to talk about it in just a minute. It is so true though. I mean, really, every homeschool person that I've ever met. A prominent atheist has just publicly professed her newfound faith in Christianity. This is a fascinating story. It's Ayan Hirsi Ali. So she was associated very closely with the new atheists. And David Silverman, the former president of the anti-religion organization American Atheists, even touted her as a champion of atheist thought and atheism activism. She was a keynote speaker at the American Atheist National Convention. But now, and, and again, she actually started off being raised Muslim. Then she became an atheist. Well, now she is saying that she is professing Christianity. This is fascinating. She said, we can't fight off these formidable forces unless we can answer the question, what is it that unites? The response that God is dead seems insufficient. So too does the attempt to find solace in the rules-based liberal international order. The only credible answer I believe lies in our desire to uphold the legacy of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Were you guys shocked to read this? Or, I mean, we're seeing this happen slowly with people in all different sorts of uh, the secular arenas. But were you shocked by, by this woman in particular? Because she's been a very outspoken atheist. 
Um, I, I wasn't because I'm not that familiar with her, but um, but I think she's right. It, Christianity has it all. So if you know you're looking, it certainly can fill a void if there's one in your life. Right, and and I think it it's you're talking to the Blazes resident agnostic here. I think, but um, I think that mm. there's some social ills um, you've seen come from the lack of religion. And I think, and and I said this during the the COVID crisis. I think that the whole reason that we shut everything down, that we stopped everything, is that people want to live for today in this life and they don't believe in an afterlife. So it used to be when you had other pandemics, you know, even the Black Plague, you thought you were going to a different place and what might be a better place. But I think we've become so focused on the here and the now and what happens now. And that's why you saw the shutdowns and them doing, well, we just got to do something to, to stop all these people from dying. And I think that plays into it. So it, it's interesting that one of the responses to that, I think, has been the increase in people finding religion. Yeah, I mean, her particular conversion, if we can call it that, is a little, is interesting to me. In that, what she says is, I mean, who knows what's you know, whether she had a personal experience or what's going on in her heart, uh, but she she almost presents it as this was just a logical option, you know, everything else mm. is not going to work, and this seems like it should work, and we have to save civilization. So I'm going to plant my flag in with, with these guys. And I, I, I heard some people there, this morning were talking to me, and they were cynical even about what she was saying. But I sort of welcome it. I think there's going to be a lot more people who look around, and they, they value truth, goodness, and beauty. And they think, look, I, I, I'm going to plant my flag with these guys. I'm going to go over here just because I don't want this, and it has to be fought somehow. And they see that religion is somehow necessary. And a lot of the founders thought that too. Some of them who weren't even that religious, they all thought, well, you need Christianity in order for all this to work. Uh, you know, they all acknowledge that. And so you, right. Elon Musk says something similar recently, when he, last, a couple years ago when he was on the Babylon Bee podcast, right? He said, Jesus might not be saving people, I don't know if he's still doing that, but an eye for an eye will leave everyone blind, you know? I mean, <laughs> so I, I like the teaching, right? And I think that's happening because of how bad things are getting, and it's really, mm. really interesting to me. Mm. You know, another interesting example along those lines is Bill Maher, who's an obvious atheist, and I don't think he likes religion of any variety, but he's been really outspoken lately and kind of supportive of, of Christianity and, and Jews. He sees that there is benefit to uh, those particular uh, theologies, and I, he, you know, he's speaking out against the violence that happens when people become extremists in in other religions mm -hmm. and it doesn't turn out well. Right, and I, I think that it's been surprising to see a lot of people um, who maybe aren't in the political realm like the two people we've just been talking about, mm -hmm. but Kat Von D, she's yeah. a really famous kind of TV and music star. She was on LA Inc. back in the day. She had a really um, famous makeup line at one point in time, which I personally loved. Uh, but she was here in studio on Ali Bestucky's show, Relatable, recently talking about her conversion to Christianity, and we're going to play a clip of that. My husband and I, we look at our, the Rolodex of friends that we have, and the ones that are dictating their life through that, and they're making life decisions through tarot or through, um, you know, some of the witchcraft stuff, like... Uh, even the meditation stuff or like, you know, and I'm, I'm going to definitely offend a lot of people, but like the, the ayahuasca trips or the, the meditation caps and silent retreats, all the things yeah. that I used to do, except I never did ayahuasca, but like, they're all so miserable. Yeah. And like, they're the most broke people. Usually most of them are single. They don't have stability. And I'm talking about like both financial and like the love around them. Right. There's always these, this drama and dread and doom and gloom. And I was one of them, you know? Yeah. And it's like, that's one thing that I would look around at my Christian friends and I'm like, they're not perfect by any means, Yeah. but I want what you have, you know, mm -hmm. like I love the light that you have. And it's like, um, so, so, you know, we're like, let's not be dummies anymore. And let's just like figure out what this, like this obviously hasn't worked for us, you know, let's yeah. like explore this. And so that's kind of like my whole perspective on it. So it seems like the common thread with the majority of these people is they're saying, I just didn't want to live life anymore without hope. Everything was so depressing. I was miserable and I needed something greater than what we're just seeing right now. And, you, I, and I think the pandemic really did bring that out. And like, that was you talk, what you talked about, Rob. The pandemic really brought that out in a lot of people where they were like, there has to be something more. 
when we're faced with a possible end or life as we know it completely changing, there's got to be something more. I do have a clip of one person, though, who isn't quite on board. Can we play that real quick? And this is a long one, although I'm, I'm going to get the Aaron Rodgers treatment, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to be calling him or whoever did his surgery because we need to speed this up. But yeah, I thought about it a little bit. I mean, you know, I'm not a religious person or anything. And if there wasn't God, like, this is proof that there isn't. This is f***ed up. Um, so, yeah, it just, it's just f***ed up because, like, six minutes in, f***ing eat my Achilles. I mean, what the f***? So that was uh, soccer player Megan Rapino who uh, had an Achilles injury during her fi the final game of her career, and it happened like right at the beginning of the game. And so she said, well, this is proof that God doesn't exist. So... Because the universe revolves around her. Right. Right? So, so obviously, uh, <laughs> there can't be a God right. because... Of her injury. It didn't go the way she wanted it to. Exactly. Huh. That's great. So, That's we'll just... Good. If there was a God, it would worship... The God would worship her. Her, yes. <laughs> Perfect yeah. point. Yeah. The, the Washington Free Beacon has an mm. excellent satire piece. Actually, I don't think it's a satire piece saying that it's actually proof that there is a God. <laughs> and then the, I did, the Washington Free Beacons was a letter from God to Megan Rapinoe saying, yes, it was me. <laughs> I'm going to wait for the Babylon B to weigh in. Uh, we, oh, yeah. we will have some op-eds about Kat Von D uh, and uh, about that interview, which is really g doing gangbusters uh, for Allie uh, this week at Blaze Media. It is fantastic. And I, I have to say, a lot of people really came at her and said, I don't think this is real. This doesn't seem authentic. You can't just, the pendulum can't swing that far the other direction. Mm -hmm. But after watching the interview, listening to the interview, reading what she has to say about it, and then we, a lot of us got to meet her in person here at the studio. It, it's very genuine to me. I mean, I, I, I think that she's really taking a bold step out to announce her faith and go all in. I mean, she said, I'm on fire for Jesus, and that's really going all in. So I, I was very impressed. Anytime someone is that bold in their faith and willing to, to share it in the way, I think it's so admirable. So, yeah, very well worth a watch and a listen. It's a great interview. All right, so we're going to go to break. We'll be right back. Well, it's what we've all been waiting for, the streets of San Francisco getting cleaned up, looking pristine, except they were done in preparation for a visit from China's president, Xi Jinping. The homeless were just tossed off the streets, barricades put up in place to keep people away from the buildings. And Governor Gavin Newsom, everybody's favorite Democrat, he told reporters that, yes, the streets were cleaned up for their fancy visitors. Let's take a listen. Folks say, oh, they're just cleaning up this place because all those fancy leaders are coming into town. Um, that's true, because it's true. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> All right. All right, let's get final thoughts on that. <laughs> I'd feel a little pissed off if I was a San Franciscan and a Californian, and I go there every day, and I'm not safe because I'm walking through these areas, and there's, you know, human feces everywhere, and they could do something about it, but never did. Mm -hmm. It's pathetic. It's despicable. When, you know, Biden and Newsom are meeting the boss... You gotta spiff it up and make it look nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we know who they really work yeah. for. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I think the, the, the serious answer is that he's trying to say, I think in that clip, that, oh, well, I'm, I'm revising my policies because I can run a little bit to the right of the other Democratic uh, governors because I think he knows this is an issue. Mm. Should he uh, be uh, on the national scene a bit more in you know, the recent near future? Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's a joke. I mean, it's a joke. Totally agree. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. If people want to find you, they know to find you here at Blaze Media. Yes. All right, everybody have a great day.